You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. Our performances have just lacked that intensity. All right, get in touch with your suggestions this morning. You can tweet us at Off The Ball. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream if that's where you're getting us. Every Monday morning, we go through the good, the bad and the grand from the weekend's sport. So uh, in the red this morning, first thing, we've got Tottenham Hotspur and we've got Norwich. We may start with Spurs here. Johnny, I think the perfect springboard for Manchester United to just rebound from an awful run of form. And I think they were even worse than a lot of people expected. You get to the point now where everybody's talking about feeling sorry for Nuno Espirito Santo. It is a very bad situation when everybody feels sorry for your manager. Yes, like, and in a situation like this, you know, do you look at the players or do you look at the manager? Because obviously the players aren't playing for the manager, um, Harry Kane in particular. Um, but he didn't come in with a bad pedigree. Like he'd done such a good job of Wolves. It's hard to figure out how they're that bad. And it was, it's just, a, it's like the Manchester United. Um, like Manchester United have become, it's almost like they're just in the entertainment industry now. Where like every single day I'm in here, we seem to be on about Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer and Manchester United. This must be going on for about three or four years, but mm-hmm. it's really reached peak entertainment in the last few weeks. And to follow that um, performance against a Liverpool team who didn't look great at all against Brighton, it has to be said, which which raises some other questions. Um, like the, the just the, the perfect team for Manchester United to play. And um, I, I actually, I was, I'm just worried, you're just wondering how long he'll have in the job, but... You know, look at the professionalism of some of the players like Harry Kane and that. I mean, well, what's Harry Kane's like, motive at the moment? Do you think? Because does he even have one? Like, I th- that's what I would question. That he looks so disinterested to the point where he surely knows he is sabotaging any chance of a future move. The narrative around Harry Kane now seems to be that City were right not to pay the money for him. Mm. So, if the, the longer this continues, the less chance there is of a club like Manchester City coming up with a fee for him next summer. Like at the start of the season, you might have thought to yourself, "Well, come January." If there's enough money on the table, they might sell him. But nobody's going to want to buy this guy in, in January. No, like if City, and they've showed again on Saturday that they still need a number nine. Like are they going back for Kane again, even if they get 20, 25 million knocked off the fee? I'm not sure they are. It, it does seem anomalous in terms of his career. And I've seen Gary Neville speak about his professionalism and all that. Um, but like I haven't, haven't seen Spurs week to week this season. But this doesn't seem to be an outlier in terms of his no. recent performances. And... Um, I I do like I think a lot of Roy Keane's analysis is 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 very um simplistic and kind of like you know he he talks about simple things like values and so on and so forth but but he, on on issues like this he, he's one hundred percent right like you go out and perform whether you like the manager or not give it like you can moan away and you can be disgruntled but perform for ninety minutes at least put in an effort I can never really get my head around that um. You know that that as much as he's 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 obviously lost the dressing room, you're playing for your fans here as well. You know Manchester United, in fairness, they 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 produce a performance, and um, if you're paid that amount of money, you're essentially playing for the club. You're playing for the fans, and put in a shift, register a shot on target. Anyway, I mean, so I don't know. It's 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 a black mark against him, and it's a good point to make that. Um, you know, there's a bit of an asterisk there in the future in terms of people want to sign him because th- th- this can't go on any any longer. And you feel sorry for Nuno, obviously. Yeah, Brian's been in touch to say, I know we regularly lambast players for lack of effort and it can be low-hanging fruit, but Harry Kane was absolutely disgraceful on Saturday. And I don't think you'd find too many people who will disagree with that point of view at all. Uh, Patrick, meanwhile, says, Johnny's absolutely right. I'm getting ready for another bushfire season here in Perth. It's every year we run the gauntlet of the bushfire, which is directly linked to climate change. And then on another note, he says, great to see Ole winning. Um, this is <laughs> that, that At least he's conscious of... Uh, that's Brian, is it? It's the uh, Patrick. Patrick, it's at it. least Patrick is... I mean, he's conscious of ultimately what matters in life, namely sport, and he's also vaguely conscious of the climate because he lives in, in Australia, which has been at the centre of a hell of a lot of crap over the last few years in terms of climate and, and and it is interesting the, the, the sport sort of, is the great triviality like it is but it's never been more so than right now because like we we spend hours and hours and hours debating all these contract when the world is burning absolutely no. i mean and, I, and we will do it for the next two hours i think uh cognitive dissonance is the very definition of us this debating ollie in this sort of context uh, at, at this moment um, like but like when, when you talk about manchester united you, it's an interesting point you make it is like the entertainment industry defined by united that they are by and large the biggest story in town even if they were winning every single game mm. but because of the boom bust cycle under Solskjaer it's become even more compelling that the conversation around Manchester United and there was almost this concerted effort I felt in the Sky Studio on Saturday night where Gary Neville and Roy Keane just couldn't smile they couldn't say anything positive they kind of 
feel really aware of the criticism that they've been under over, you know, not throwing their buddy under the bus. And I felt that despite getting a big win, I think, uh, away from home against a, good, a decent team, uh, that they were just a little bit reluctant to say, you know, this is this was a really good result for Manchester United. Because, let's face it, it, it buys all a time. It does change the narrative, if even just for 48 hours. Well, I, I'm... Uh, so, Dion Fanny had an article in The Currency Saturday about the nostalgic element to all of this, and it, it was so true because you're talking about Roy Keane and uh, Gary Neville. So, Roy Keane, what's he, 50 now? Um, I think he turned 50 when the two of them did the video or whatever. So, there, there are obviously young players playing today who have no recollection of Roy Keane, really, mm-hmm. at all, or certainly don't remember him uh, playing at his pomp. Um so when you see like the, the the shadow of of Ferguson over over the proceedings, how he's kind of involved himself wittingly or unwittingly in the narrative, Solskjaer being there is that nostalgia that brings you back to Munich, brings you back to like the glory days, and um, it, it was it, nostalgia was 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 sort of the the theme of the piece was like nostalgia is a terrible thing really because we need to move on here. Um, but it was really funny that this is like a completely different, uh, like going off to another tangent here. I was watching Leo Craigale yesterday. I was like having this lazy day in the couch and Johnny Pilkington was featured. And it was like, Leo Craigale is just so good. Yeah. Like it's, it's such a simple format. They've effectively interviewed the player in question, maybe two or three other people. And then they show footage from the game. So there's much more to it than that. Like, so they, they put a simple format. But he, they were, he was like, so it was going back to 1995 when I just started secondary school. And then 1998... Um, when I remember I was like in third or fourth year but they were playing songs from that era which like completely brought me back I remember like I think I had my first girlfriend then I remember that song by Blur was out at the time and um, it, like this nostalgia just and it's particularly on a Sunday completely overtook me yesterday and so much of the Man United narrative is a nostalgia for the old time when the Premier League was great I was younger um, I hated Man United but they were you know Roy Keane and Alex Ferguson it, it was impossible and it was taken over it was sweeping Ireland at the time. I remember as a kid, like everyone used to watch, go to the the pub to watch Sky and and see Man United like become the dominant force. Eric Cantona and all that. And I think an awful lot of the the Man United stuff now is pining for those days. Like, and that's why Solskjaer, to some extent, is in the job because there's a hell of a lot of nostalgia going on there. And um, like then when you have Fergus, when you have sorry Keane and Gary Neville they're talking about like their buddy and aware that they're now part of the narrative as well it's just yeah. like well what year are we in here like and, and right. then they play a combined strike force of 70 as well just to add to that <laughs> well, I was going to say I mean uh, Ronaldo goes way back to that time as well that's like, it, that's, exactly. obviously that's part of the, the lure of that transfer even though the, the Ronaldo question is so interesting because he's clearly not doing a bad job himself in terms of his own capabilities but it's what it does to the rest of the team and it's I think I think Roy Keane I mean he may be lauded as somebody who just creates controversy without giving you any sort of insight but I thought he made a really good point on Saturday that if you're not very good at pressing just sit in and a team with Ronaldo probably should be doing that a little bit more and it was lunacy to try that against Liverpool the previous week and when you do sit in and when you do find a little bit of space in behind the opposition defence Ronaldo can absolutely devastate you and it's not a nostalgia signing when you see Ronaldo in that sort of form on Saturday how good how bad were Spurs though do you but know that, like, of course that is if, if you factor. genuinely as a as a top level coach now if you're presented with Cavani and Ronaldo as your front two like as a, as and that's what you're set up against um, with Matic in midfield I mean you shouldn't be that worried like this is a high a high pressure high intensity the Premier League is an incredibly fast game playing at the, played at its best if Man City play Liverpool particularly um, so I, I don't know like is it more of a reflection on how pathetic Spurs were but it's just typical Man United that's they just swung this almost like extremes of, of, of performance or extremes of narrative that um, Oli has brought them back. But like, obviously the problems remain, deep problems. And um, we, we may talk about like some of the clubs coming up, but there's an, there, there's an interesting battle there for sort of fourth place. Yeah. And I don't think at the moment, Manchester United, I wouldn't fancy them to finish in the top four the way they've looked. I think... Um, West Ham obviously are doing very well but Arsenal are, are clicking now and um, you know Man, Man United just have probably too many problems there and I'm not sure they're all Solskjaer related but it, it, that'll be an interesting art of the season ahead Well hopefully because it definitely felt for the first couple of games of the season when Ronaldo scored in his debut for example that the top four was boxed off and that nobody else was getting in there we, we need Manchester United to be flaky for, for this thing to be alive because now Liverpool Manchester City both 
deservedly dropping points on, on Saturday and uh, I, I do think that the, that top three will probably pull away as the season goes on but if Manchester United constantly go boom bust then West Ham Arsenal Spurs potentially Leicester and then maybe uh, Brighton and Everton come into this conversation about who's going to get the, the fourth spot and that just leads to a really interesting sort of narrative but who, who is it for you at the moment if you had to pick as to, as to who's going to come fourth? <sighs> Possibly Arsenal, actually. Just as a, as a, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, like I predict Manchester United to have a better season at start than they are. Maybe before Ronaldo signed, um, and I thought, like in fairness, last year I thought defensively they were quite solid, and he, Solskjaer might be con- considered a bit conservative with the way he was playing Fred and McTominay, but like I think that they're they're far better off playing conservative and using the pace that they have on the break than they are like playing gung ho like they did against Atlanta and Liverpool. Now the the Pogba situation is another elephant in the room. Like, I don't know what happens there. Um, and I, I think there were too many signs. I mean, Klopp spoke about the body language against Brighton. What about the body language of Man United in the second half? And, you know, Ronaldo should have been sent off. Pogba was sent off. So those problems haven't gone away, even though they beat an insipid Spurs. So I wouldn't really trust Man United at this stage, um, even though Oli might be gone. Um, it's hard to know, like, but I wouldn't. I, maybe Arsenal, um, but West Ham probably are coming into the picture a bit. Like they're not a million miles off. No, the yeah. Thursday, Thursday nights obviously are going to be a bit of a factor for a lot of those mm. clubs going for fourth, and it's probably a, a, a big plus in in the column for Arsenal at the moment that they Definitely. don't have to play on Thursday nights because that that screwed them up a little bit over the last little while. I think it's fair to say, but it's going to be a massive week. Obviously, Manchester United against Manchester City. It's the lunchtime kick off this Saturday. We'll have plenty of build up to it across the week because I think everybody kind of expects this to be maybe a, a back down to reality once again for United but maybe not Solskjaer has beaten Manchester City uh, in his career with United in the not too distant past so stranger things have definitely happened the, the other thing we just wanted to touch on in the bad before we move on to, to the grand this morning is, is one of the other Premier League storylines and, and we're keen to, to point out here that it's Norwich that are in the red because Norwich are bad and they will get relegated it would be astonishing if they didn't get relegated they could have got something out of the game yesterday was a crazy four minutes or whatever it was when the three goals were scored we had Andrew Mbamadeli making a rare start for Norwich and his first senior goal for the club he is very much not in the red this morning Mbamadeli could be in the green he hadn't scored before half time Jamie Redknapp says the left back Obafemi Deli I think he called him is struggling out there in fairness, he's marking Rafinha, who's a starter for Brazil yeah. right now, leads his best player, and he actually wasn't doing that badly against him. Completed so, him with a struggling striker that isn't actually getting into the Ireland setup. Well, there, there, there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, that was the, that, that was the person that that Red Nap decided to pick out at half time. But second half gets up for a corner, back of the net, lovely header, and this really passionate celebration. I, I like. I mean, we were obviously watching this kick closer than everybody else, and of course, everybody at that level desperately cares about everything they do but it just seems everything matters so much to this kid and, and he realises how important that goal was for him yesterday that people are talking about him and yes they get beaten and maybe you, he could be up for criticism for, for Rafinha's goal but I, I think that'll be harsh but I, I think by and large he comes out of it smelling like roses in comparison to a lot of his teammates but there's, like, there's, a, there's a passionate celebration and it could be a peepo in Zaggy but this was a passionate celebration in terms of exactly what you want your centre back to do he was running back to the halfway line yeah. do you know what I mean he's like <laughs> it's true I've scored but like he's come, like come back. Of, yeah, he's yeah, basically yeah. like um, rallying his players around him to come back and it's strange how we see like we see the exact same thing like you know everyone's looking at the same moon but we see it differently and Jamie Redknapp is talking about Oba Famadeli or whatever struggling against Rafinha we're looking at like a player that we we, we, we we hold in such high regard in Ireland because uh, of the performances that he's produced and then you know the night um against Serbia I think he maybe mainly Bazunu but both he and Bazunu um two kids who've come up uh, through the ranks in Ireland lifted the nation and he had that strike it was like probably the loudest like Lansdowne Road has been for for a while apart from maybe the odd goal we've gotten but that like the place went mad when 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 Obama Mandeli went forward and had that strike against Serbia and he has that in the locker and um, what's interesting for Stephen Kenny and we spoke to um, myself and Dan McDonald spoke to Stephen Rice in our podcast last week about the third Irish centre-back becoming um, a kind of a, an extra player going forward at times and it's something that I don't think opposition uh, teams can I think it's hard to set up against that because but if you've three centre backs one of them can have a bit of a licence and he certainly has that in his locker and Ireland have had like lots of chances where it's either um, Egan or mainly Duffy even Obama Mandele from open play from open play from yeah. open play like and I love to see that because it's just something that um, um, you know you don't you don't see that often certainly not at, Irish, uh, at an Irish level but um, 
I um, um, Delhi to be to be playing like that, to be scoring at this level, um, at the age that he is, it's just really, really uh, encouraging. And um, hats off to David Snay because he got an interview yeah. um, before the game um, with with uh, the, the Norwich manager uh, who's whose name uh, Daniel Fark. Fark rather and um, Fark was really good in the interview he's like um, you know the, Ida and Umoba Medele they're, they're young kids but um, he, he spoke at length about them and it's clear he has a lot of regard for them and um, it's just brilliant we're, we're absolutely overrun with players playing well at centre back at the moment and Duffy didn't do badly against Liverpool either but I saw of the game yeah um, he's well, he got, got caught out a little bit for first goal yeah uh, but like in fairness a brilliant brilliant cross or whatever but like the the, the centre back situation is very very encouraging our goalkeeper yeah. situation is, is amazingly good and if you have really good defence and a goalkeeper Stephen Kenny's squad can work from there um, at the end of the week so yeah, delighted for him so Thursday that squad gets announced I'm sure we'll have plenty on that as the week goes on just to touch on a little bit more of that David Snade piece with Daniel Farr because as you say it was a really good insight into but just just is, as a concept here right? so I, 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 I'd seen that this had about 12,000 hits on the 42 within an hour and I, I was texting him I was like Jesus fair play David like and presumably he goes oh I just called I just literally popped into the Zoom on the Norwich press conference and there weren't many there yeah yeah I was like so you've, you've created a really good piece here that I, we're all interested in but I basically do nothing than, other than turn on your laptop like yeah and well that's a bit hard he may I mean, have been in his jocks for all I know do you know D- what I mean D- like, David Snade would say he's a hard working journalist who well, he, gra- is. Ground on, he is a hard working yes. journalist and, and uh, this is an excellent piece um we we need to get comment on whether or not he was in his jocks as he did this, but uh, Fark did I'm, I'm review. Speculating, no. I mean, no. we're off for speculation here. Mm. Apparently, the the either thing was just down to availability quite a lot, as is probably said in the obvious here a lot last season, just not being available, not on the training pitch enough. Got, that's got coronavirus and like. obviously COVID, yeah. Mm and that's why he didn't get enough at championship level like that's him suggesting that he hasn't played enough with the team at a lower division and therefore isn't getting enough minutes the, the either question is very very interesting I find because uh, like I think with, with Omar Bamadeli we've obviously seen I guess greater opportunities for him in the Premier League there's no question about that and with Ida when you've got that goal scoring responsibility on you you're just going to be judged in a, in a far different way whereas with Ireland it feels that Ida can go these next 20 games and not score a goal and still put in these phenomenal performances like he did that night against Portugal mm. because he just brings all these other players into proceedings it feels with Norwich if he gets thrown in up front you've got an expectancy expectancy to score goals immediately or that's what the fans will yep. expect of like, you so well, well, well one team like has a has a horrific uh, record in, in the last few years of, of, of its striker scoring goals and the other is Norwich who are basically losing every week so it's he's in a difficult position like where Troy Parr has gone to MK Dons he's playing in the third tier um, for a club that actually by all accounts plays lovely football and is, is 100% assist in his development same with Bazuna who's gone in I don't really care what level he's at because he's going to be involved in a lot of goalkeeping it's not easy for Ida and for Ireland as well that Serbia game I mentioned he was so isolated up front and I think it's been tough for him because he's a lot has kind of been asked of him in, in at an early stage where he hasn't had much help and ultimately for Omoba Medele it's probably a lot easier to be a centre back than a striker like um, yeah. it's it, the hardest thing in football is scoring like is actually scoring goals and that's been such a problem for us obviously since Robbie Keane but we still have um, we still have a lot of we still have three or four players who have the potential to get there, and you're just hoping that they get club game time effectively. And and that's my point exactly is that it, it is easier to make that mark straight away in both systems. I would argue with, with Norwich and with, with Ireland. Like when, when he's talking about Ida, he says he has his instincts in and around the box and to show this with consistency each and every training, working unbelievably hard, also each and every game when he gets the chance to impress. If it's 50 minutes, use your chance, use your chance. If it's international games for Ireland, use your chance and score. It's interesting that Fark mentions Ireland as an opportunity for him to actually get minutes and, and get game time and, and show that he can he can use his chances, he says. Like, he's obviously a, a, an intelligent man. He, he'll know that there's more to his game than, than scoring goals. My just one concern is that you've got 50 minutes to impress maybe in the Norwich shirt. Do you have to be getting on the score sheet to actually say that you've used your chance properly? Mm. Maybe not. Maybe like maybe it goes way beyond that. With regards to Omar Bamadeli, and again, this is in the build-up to, to Sunday's game, he, uh, he says, but Andrew, how much I love him and I'm excited by him, showed at the crunch time period last season. I had other options, but trusted him. 18 years old at that time to be in the central position, to keep position in defence. He fulfilled my wishes. Uh, then he, he like talks generally about these two guys. He says, always it's important with the right timing. Otherwise, you can ruin their career really quickly. We have to look after them. I was never doubtful to put a young player in the spotlight once I think they are prepared. So there is certainly that level of, of concern within his own head. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he understands like the, the you know, the 
the position of David Snaid as well in the Irish kind of journalistic um, hierarchy, he knows like these words really, really matter. Like, because I mean, he probably wasn't expected to at an at an Orange uh, presser against Leeds to be thrown in these questions about Ida and Omoba Omoba Yeah, and he's probably like. Um, yeah, because he gave really detailed answers. Like he's kind of so he he was maybe playing to the Irish audience, but he's just uh, I, I, it's one of one of the sports and highlights of the year for me was like either of his performances either against Portugal or Serbia that he was thrown in, and it was a lot of a lot of it was real old school last ditch defending stuff as well, yeah. which was great. Um, and you know the, that image of him and Bazuno out in the pitch before the game, just the two of them alone in the Aviva Stadium. Imagine the careers that they could have. Yeah. Yeah, it is, and it's genuinely exciting. I I think I tweeted at the time during that Serbia game. I would have done anything, anything to see that Oma Bamzeli. I actually remember that tweet. That was like, yeah. and I, I, it's getting nostalgic for I it now. Yeah, absolutely anything. Yeah. So ho- hopefully that, that time comes where he does net for, for Ireland. But he's off the mark for Norwich at least. Uh, we should bring this on actually to the Amber, Johnny. We've put the League of Ireland in the Amber this morning. Is, is this fair enough, Shamrock Rovers? I mean, back to back that the... the you could look at this one of two ways. It hasn't exactly been an amazing League of Ireland season as a whole. Uh, and maybe Rovers going back to back without getting a massive challenge isn't exactly great news. Obviously, Rovers will be in the green this morning. Yeah, I suppose um, I think I think the standard of the League of Ireland is is pretty high at the moment. And I think that was borne out by the fact that Bowes and Dundalk um, performed so well in Europe, despite the fact that in the league, I mean, Dundalk are third or fourth last and Bowes are miles off the pace this season so I think that's an indication that there's more strength and depth maybe than people think St. Pat's didn't play in Europe but they've been the clear second best team this season um, but I suppose uh, like Stephen Bradley brought this up after the game and in fairness it's it's, ultra, it's it's utterly staggering that a team that is running away with the league title hasn't had one player of the month now I think it's probably the greatest um, certainty of all time that there'll be a Shamrock Rovers player in October just because the journalists will want to um, hold face with Stephen Bradley who said like I think his words were the, <laughs> the journalists who vote for this should have a long look at themselves like and <laughs> I'd have to be honest now I'm very lazy I don't really tend to vote in the which is the same as like if you don't vote in an election well you're, you're party responsible you can't change things if you don't vote so I don't really tend to vote in them That's but, a classic manager who's in a very good position looking for some reason <laughs> some some sort of siege mentality because yeah. things are going too well you know Yeah because in fairness though, I think he does believe that Rovers are not getting the credit that they deserve and okay. I mentioned Europe I think it's entirely down to the fact that people think they didn't perform in Europe now it's not that they flopped in Europe but I think they didn't against Talon at the Europa Conference group stages um, I think they did have a they were probably favourites in that time I don't think they really performed at their own level and there were a lot of individual mistakes across the two uh, legs but if you watch them the other night um like they've some beautiful footballers, like like Dylan Watts, um, Danny Mandroyu, uh, you know some of the things they do. Mandroyu will probably be Player of the Month, I think, for uh, for October, and uh, they were lovely to watch. I mean, they they beat Finn Harps in the first sort of uh, the game was over after five minutes, effectively. But you know, we we had a big debate with Declan McBennett not that long ago about like. You know, which was at times heated about RT's coverage of the League of Ireland, and one thing he said is we need more of a title race. And I was like, well, it's not really our... There's not much we can do about making it into a title race. But ultimately, the last two years, there hasn't been a title race. And it, it's a little bit of a damn squib that somebody isn't challenging Sean Rovers. And I think they haven't been actually at their best. I think there was another gear there if needed mm. be, and they just didn't need to go for it. Conversely, the battle not to finish second last is, is really, really uh, fascinating. The battle for Europe is fascinating. And Pats are playing Bowes tonight. I think that'll be a really interesting game if you're in the Dublin area. Um, the playoffs are starting the first division. But just, I suppose... We could have done with more of a title race, and that game on Friday night, like Shamrock Rovers were getting coronated, but there wasn't any. There was a sense of formality about it, and that's not Shamrock Rovers' fault. But with, um, I suppose, finally on that Derry City, um, with the signings that they're making and the backing that they have from a very, very uh, wealthy benefactor, and with the progress Pats are making, I would hope next season it'll be closer. Right. Well, that's uh, a good note to, to leave the title race on. As you said, there's much more to be decided elsewhere in the League of Ireland Premier Division anyway over the next little while and of course the, the First Division too. Uh, we're just going to skip on to the good from the weekend just briefly to mention the club GEA we're going to come back to this later on we're going to talk about Kerry we're going to talk about Tyrone we're going to talk about the madness at the end of the Offaly uh, football final and the Donegal hurling final which had a first winner since the, the 1970s we're going to come back to that at around half past eight but a good weekend for club GEA we just want to mention here finally in the performance rankings this morning Bryony Frost Johnny because this is a story that people might have missed over the last couple of weeks. 
Yeah, so Briny Frost, um, and I want to be a small bit careful about how I word this because it's a, kind of an ongoing investigation yeah. in Britain. But Briny Frost has been a poster girl for, um, I think she's been... I think she's been fantastic for, for racing in general. Um, now, there's very much a Marmite element to Bryony Frost. Like, she's she's over the top after races in terms of her excitement and how much she loves the buzz. And she's completely different to Rachel Blackmore in that sense, where Rachel Blackmore effectively gives fairly run-of-the-mill interviews and effectively just does her talking uh, on the horse. Bryony is like, she'll give you an interview for 20 minutes about, like, jumping the second last or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So she's... She's she's this really kind of effervescent rider and she's very talented. Um, but the horse that is associated with her most by a long stretch is Frodon. Mm. And he won the big race on Down Royal, which was her first, uh, I think her first ride in Ireland as a professional, actually. Um, and it was an amazing race. We watched it, myself, Dan and uh, JD pretty much watched the race before we came on on, on uh, Saturday. Uh, so certainly Dan and I did anyway. And it was a great race to watch. Um, she, you know, Frodon looked like he was going to be swamped too out, but he battled and battled and battled, and he won. And Bryony was obviously in great form after the race. But the the context of this is a, is an investigation into allegations that she made of bullying and harassment against Robbie Dunn. Mm. And there's now what what's interesting is that the the, the jockeys, um, the professional jockeys association. Once the matter closed because um, details of the investigation were leaked to the press, particularly yeah. I think the Sunday Times, um, which is interesting because Bryony is a member of the, the PGA, so like she is one of the rank. Um, and I do wonder, um, normally these things get, you know, the, what I suppose what happens in the weighing room stays in the weighing room or, or we sort it out in the weighing room. If somebody has an issue with you, he or she will probably bring it up with you. Um, Bryony's rides have gone down a lot in in terms of this year, this time of year versus this time last year, and I I'm I'm, I'm speculating here, but I do wonder will this actually hurt her career that she's seen to do something you shouldn't uh, and bring up um, you know these these allegations to uh, the authorities rather than deal with them internally. And I'm not taking any sides about this, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out when you have the Jockeys Association now say, actually, we want this closed because she's not he's not going to get a fair trial, sorry. Yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned there, the, the allegations have been made. There is an investigation ongoing and that uh, the full investigation, which is going to be carried out by the BHA, will, will hopefully go ahead despite the media leak over the next little while. Yeah, so, uh, and, and bri- that up. Bri- briefly on it, like Robbie Dunn's um, alleged criticisms of her were to do with race riding techniques and like, the suggestion that you know the, she, he was kind of wronged on a horse when she was riding another, and there were just things that happened within a race. These things happen all the time. Um, but I, I think on the day the stewards decided that there wasn't any case to be made against Bryony Frost, that doesn't necessarily mean they make mistakes as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that she wasn't, you know, riding a little bit carelessly or whatever. But the, I suppose the point is that they didn't deal with it internally, and um, she's probably. It's going to be tough for her now because she, you know, she's now it's been leaked. She, she, it, it may not never go to a proper fair hearing. And I think in in the context of all of that, Saturday was a really timely victory for her because she's a very talented rider and, a, to my mind, a great ambassador for the sport. Yeah. So that's Bryony Frost finishing up the performance rankings this morning. Did you let performance rankings? She is in the green. As I say, we'll come back to Club GA a little bit later on this morning. So that is this morning's performance rankings. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. 